Great. So I'd like to thank Sonia and the other organizers of BPPB for the invitation. It's great to uh, talk about this work and share it with a physics and biophysics audience. And so to start out, what is topological data analysis? And so I'll motivate this with sort of a historical picture by Pablo Picasso. So this is all the work of a very talented former grad student, Andre Bhaskar, who's now at Yale. And so he was just interested in this idea of how we might be able to visualize the shape of multidimensional data, and especially as a way to understand biological form. So Pablo Picasso had his own take on this, and he was trying to deconstruct how different bulls would look. And he was like, oh, maybe we can go from something that's very, very similar to the real representation, but can we have capture of essence as some kind of skeleton and use this to understand the bull from different perspectives and different species and what have you. Okay, so in some sense, how do we think about shape? And so maybe I'll phrase this in a slightly different way as a thought experiment. So I'd like you to, I'm going to hold an imaginary object in my hands, but I'm gonna turn the lights off. So you can't really see what I'm holding, but I'll give you some information. So I'll kind of splatter some spots of paint on this object in the dark. And so based on these spots of paint, can you go back and visually represent what the actual shape of this object is. Okay, so the question is, can the complete shape of an object be inferred from this pattern of spots? And so as humans, we have a lot of pattern recognition that's encoded into our brains, and maybe Meng said we'll talk a little bit more about this. And so there's ways that we can interpret this, right? We might see like how close two spots are to each other. We might recognize that they're regions of negative space. And so like, okay, based on this, we look at it, it's like, okay, it's something that looks maybe like a pretzel. Okay, and so maybe in a more mathematical set down point, what we'd like to do is go from some discrete cloud of points and interpret this as a simpler continuous shape, basically a manifold in lower dimensional space. Okay, so we'd like to have some high dimensional data sets. We'd like to infer the shape of this, and we'll do this more quantitatively by measuring the spatial proximity of these points and hopefully they all reside in this lower dimensional manifold and there's interesting information that's encoded in how this occurs. And so I've shown this in three dimensions, but you can imagine a very high dimensional space like gene expression and similar ideas would be relevant as well. Okay, so that's sort of the topology side. Um, our lab is very interested in the central question of how epithelial cells coordinate migration. And so we typically use some combination of engineered biomaterials. We do a lot of live cell imaging and we're also using computer vision to understand how this all works. And so one idea that has fascinated me is that tissues look a lot like soft or active or living materials. And so for instance, if you look at this monolayer of epithelial cells, uh, you see a lot of coordinated motions. You could see leaders that are guiding their followers to uh, migrate into empty space. You could see that cells move in swirling motions or coordinated streams, or they even get ejected out of the plane. And so if I look at these uh, dynamics of emergent pattern and self-organization, it looks a lot like, for instance, a soft glassy material. So if you look at this uh, depiction, you see that there's all these brightly colored hotspots where each particle will move in a coordinated way with their nearest neighbors. And there's a lot of dynamic heterogeneity that occurs over many length scales in space and time, okay? And so one way that captures all of this is this famous phase diagram for a jamming transition, right? And so you can imagine that given some generic material, you could, for instance, increase the temperature to transition from a jammed arrested state to a more fluid uh, motile states. You could also imagine uh, decreasing the density to drive an unjamming transition, or you can apply shear stress. Okay, and this is probably some historic work from something like 25 years ago from Andre Liu and Sid Nagel, as well as uh, Dave Weitz and Veronique Trapp. Now, Jeff Redberg proposed a very provocative idea is that maybe these jamming transitions for soft matter are also relevant for monolayers of living cells. And so you can map to these different control parameters. So you can think about changing the adhesion between cells. So as they're less sticky to each other, it might be more capable for them to flow. You could make them more motile and you could also increase the density and all of these would cause the transition from something that's pretty arrested to something that's maybe more fluid-like and the cells can rearrange in some way. 
Okay, and so this is some of our very early work. So this is now experimental data of mammary epithelial cells. So I've labeled here only the nucleus, and you see that the cells tend to exhibit very random motion. They tend to move into empty regions. And so you see they're moving pretty quickly. This is a time scale of hours. But as the cells get increasingly dense, you see that there's this gradual slowdown in their motility until eventually motility gets arrested as the cells become fully confluent and occupy most of the available space. Okay, so there seems to be some connection between this jamming transition and increasing density. But if you go back historically, this jamming transition was not observed for a very high density glass-like state. It was actually observed for a very low density gel-like state. Okay, and so if you look at this very early paper from Dave Weitz, he was considering these colloidal gels that are these tenuous space filling networks. And so he showed that by very subtly changing the volume fraction, by changing the temperature or applying shear, you could perturb it from a solid-like to a more fluid-like state. Okay, and so this is a very interesting uh, material system. So this tends to occur when you have so strong short range attraction between colloidal particles. So there's many years of work in the chemical engineering colloidal community where they want to keep these particles stabilized in solution, be it paint, be it food products or what have you. But if there's, for instance, too much salt, these particles start to aggregate in a very particular way. And so this is a special case where the first time these particles interact, they adhere irreversibly and then new particles will join this aggregate from long distances purely through diffusion. And this gives you this fractal-like network that was uh, articulated by Whitman Sander probably in the early 80s. Yep. So you can also see basically a jamming transition from fluid-like to solid-like in these very low density of space filling gels. So the question is, there's sort of these jamming transitions at low density and high density for soft matter systems. Could we also see this in living systems? And up to this point, people have only seen this in high density cellular states. Okay, so this is sort of an accidental discovery by my first grad student, Susan Leggett, who's just started her lab at UIUC. And so she observed that normal cells are very sensitive to the growth factor that we add into the media. Okay, and so as long as these cells have a lot of epidermal growth factor, EGF, they're very happy, they proliferate a lot, and they migrate a lot. And so you saw this rapid increase in density driving arrest. But she wanted to see what would happen if we kind of decreased this concentration of EGF. And so she expected that this should significantly slow the rate of proliferation and migration. And would this also lead to some kind of jamming transition, like what we're seeing for colloidal gels? Okay, so now I'll show a video of these same mammary epithelial cells at low EGF, whereas before it was high to EGF, and you see that they're a lot more sluggish, right? The cells are not moving too, too much. They seem to be clustering together, and you see something like a tenuous space filling network over the same period of about 60 hours, right? So it doesn't look like they're dead. So they're still wiggling a little bit, but they're not zooming around the screen like what I saw previously. Okay, and so here's sort of some representative snapshots over 60 hours at high EGF. You see there's a rapid increase in cell density until the cells fully are confluent. They occupy all the space. They are pretty arrested. But in low EGF, the cells are not moving too, too much. Like configuration stays about the same from 36 to 60 hours. It looks pretty arrested. But maybe there's a little more connections between them, and maybe there's a little bit more of a tenuous space filling uh, morphology. Okay, and so what tends to happen is very analogous to what we're seeing with colloids. So these cells are basically executing something like a random walk. They'd start to attach to each other, and this would be an irreversible act, and they wouldn't disperse again after that. And so as basically a rough estimate, we can look at, for instance, a mean square displacement of each cell. We might expect that for random motion, we'd see a mean square displacement that scales as a time lag the first power, if the cells are more directed, we would see a mean square displacement of the scale to the time lag uh, squared. And so there's a lot of scatter in what we see in the single cell mean square displacement, but we see that by and large it's closer to one than two. Although I appreciate that there is a lot of variability in what would be an effective diffusion coefficient, this three factor ahead of it. Okay, so the cells are moving randomly. Can we think more about the structure 
of these fractals. And this has also been historically studied. So one way to look at this is to calculate a fractal dimension to scale the cluster mass with its radius. And if we draw these imaginary circles, rings around the centroid, we can count the number of particles that are contained with this ring and scale it as the radius of gyration to some exponents. Okay, and so in our confluent case, it's sort of boring. We see that it's a solid mass. So the number of uh, cells within each radius scales as a radius squared, right? Because it's completely filled, it's not that interesting. But with low EGF, you see that the density appears to be decreasing with these increasing radii. And so we'd expect the fractal dimension to be a little bit less than two. Okay, when we actually measure this, we see that the fractal dimension is indeed less than two. It's actually 1.75, and this is true out to about maybe two orders of magnitude or so. And so this is actually quite intriguing. Now, if you go back to these 1980s papers with these fractal aggregates for diffusion limited aggregation, they also saw 1.75 as a fractal dimension. And so it's very striking that the gold colloids are just a soft matter system. These are non-living particles, but our living cells ex uh, exhibit exactly the same behavior. And this is because well, physics is quite similar. They're both exhibiting a random walk and we also see the strong attraction driving irreversible aggregation. Now, if you wait a little bit longer, um, we no longer see this occurring is that these dispersed clusters tend to merge over time. There's some cells that migrate outwards and then connect together in the spanning network. And that's when you get something that's based on. Okay, so just as a phenomenological way to represent this, we can talk about, for instance, sort of an order parameter. We'll count the number of nearest neighbors and this allows us to distinguish between an individual phase and a clustered phase and maybe these spanning phases. And so empirically, as we look at how these patterns evolve over time, we see a gradual increase in the number of nearest neighbors. This is sort of like a bond number. And at something like four nearest neighbors, we typically associate with clusters. And as we go above seven, we see something that's more like a spanning number. And so tying this all together, at very low EGF concentrations over time, we see that there's a transition from individual to dispersed clusters to a connected spanning network. That's a function of the nearest neighbor order parameter. We see that this is also associated with going from motility to a jamming transition that's arrested as these cells start to stick together. But if we start to increase the EGF concentration, we recover this Fredberg regime of either quickly moving subconfluent cells that then jam at very high numbers of neighbors. Okay, so in some sense, we've captured maybe a different region of this jamming diagram. So Fredberg argued that monolayers jam at high EGF as a function of increased adhesion, increased density, or decreased motility. We're saying that if we decrease EGF, we basically shift to this other region where we're at low density, but we jam because motility is also slow. Okay, so this actually fits together and is fully con consistent with this previous picture. Okay, so this is more of a biophysics story, but I'll come back to the topology shortly. So we've shown that these growth factor dependent cells proliferate and migrate slowly when we decrease EGF in the media. We show that our dispersed individuals exhibit random migration and irreversible adhesion to form fractal-like clusters. I haven't talked about this here, but there's sort of these transient leader cells that drive what we'd call dynamic heterogeneity and link clusters in the spanning network. We can construct a phase diagram based on EGF and local density that captures both this high density glass-like regime and a low density gel-like regime for jamming and arrest of motility living cells. And we can also duplicate this if we just use drugs to inhibit uh, this growth factor receptor signaling. Okay, so we have lots of different cellular patterns at different densities. Let's come back to this topology story. Can we use sort of the uh, organization of these points and now train a computer to recognize these different experimental regimes. Okay, so I talked about using discrete points to sample this low dimensional manifold. And so if you look at this visually, we obviously can tell the difference between individual cells and these clusters and confluency, but there are some nuances in that typically when we do these measurements, you have the same number of particles, 
And so the spatial connectivity is weighted by the number of points. It's not so clear how to correct for this if there's a very different number of cells in each of these snapshots. And again, it wasn't obvious to me that this would work. So biology is messy. It's stochastic, it's noisy. There's all these other behaviors going on. Uh, cells are heterogeneous. There's a lot of experimental variability. So we were like, okay, let's just try this and see if this works at all. Okay, so how do we actually encode the spatial connectivity between points? And so now as a simple example, consider these seven points. We'll draw these imaginary circles of radius epsilon one around them. And so for small epsilon, we see that these points are all disconnected. And so we represent this as a barcode with basically seven disconnected entities. If we now increase above some critical radius and we go to this radius epsilon two, we see that now these gray circles overlap. And so we've connected these seven points together into a single with seven edges. And we also see a connected loop enclosing an empty region. And so these are associated with basically edges and loops uh, respectively. And once we go a little bit further to this very large epsilon three, then we actually collapse this empty region. So the loop is only present for a certain uh, range of filtration distances between epsilon one and epsilon three, but this connectivity occurs indefinitely for very large uh, radii epsilon. Okay, so this is known as a persistence barcode. Um, we can maybe visualize this a little bit more through something called a persistence diagram. And so we kind of look at the distance of these points from some diagonal. And this persistence tells us how basically stable these features are with varying epsilon. And so the key premise is that we're interested in persistent features that occur across large ranges of uh, filtration epsilon. And so this will tell us something meaningful about the topological invariance in our system. Okay, so any shape we can encode using these persistence diagrams. Now what we'd like to do is compare two sets of shapes with persistence homology. And so basically how similar or dissimilar topologically are two sets of points. And so here you can see there's a very slight difference between pattern one and pattern two. And so what we'd like to do now is consist, construct a persistence diagram for each set of point clouds and we'd like to extract topological features. Now, given these persistence diagrams, we'd like to compare them. One approach, although not the only one, is to use something called a Wasserstein distance. This is also known as an earth mover's distance. And what you might want to do is basically do an optimal transport calculation. So given some probability distribution or a pile of dirt, X, how easily can we move this dirt around? So what's the least amount of dirt we can move over the shortest distance to get this pile of dirt X to move to look like the pile of dirt Y. Okay, so we're weighting the cost of reorganizing X into Y based on the amount of stuff we have to move and how far we have to move it. So hence there's an optimal transport question to figure out how to do this most efficiently. In practice for this, we're going to ignore everything near the diagonal. We're going to say that these are not very persistent, so presumably not very interesting. And we have to solve an assignment problem and figure out which of the remaining topological features are close to each other. And this gives us an idea of how topologically similar or dissimilar these will have to be. And so the problem is this is computationally quite expensive to do. Okay, and we also haven't addressed this issue of weighting by the number of points, which could completely skew our readout. So instead of doing this, we did something different. So we can look at the connectivity between points. This is betting number zero, our uh, dimension zero homology, but we can also look at basically the negative spaces are these loops, which is bang number one or dimension one homology. So we see that for these individual particles, they tend to be somewhat separated. But as we have these dispersed branching aggregates, we see larger and larger loops. And if we have these separated clusters, we see even larger loops as well. Okay, and so this actually gives us additional information because these loops are ca capturing the spatial organization of these cells over very long distances. So it's not the same as what we normally do for some radial uh, probability distribution, for instance, for a classical order parameter. And so in practice for each of these uh, cell configurations, we constrict this persistence diagram and we can start to match and see which of these features is close to each other to see how different or similar they might be. Okay, and so just to make sure this works, we 
also did some simulations. So we did a very simple self-propelled particle model where these cells had varying propulsion as well as varying adhesion to each other. And you see over time, at least this uh, set of cells will initially start to form these dispersed clusters. And so at varying levels of adhesion propulsion, we could either get a mostly individual phase, sort of these branch phase, more clusters and highly uh, compacted clusters as well. And so considering at least the final time point where the configurations look relatively similar, we can see that at high propulsion or strong propulsion and weak adhesion, we have individual phases, sort of this intermediate regime, we see either branches or branches with clusters and at very weak propulsion and high adhesion, we see this very compacted clusters. Okay, and this is again, based on our order parameter of looking at this local density of nearest neighbors. We can now feed basically all of the persistence diagrams into and do hierarchical clustering based on this foster time distance. And we actually recover most of the same information. So we can recover basically these individual phases. We see these clustered phases. And then there's some transition regime based on branching or branching with clusters. Okay, so this is for constant number, just to make sure this worked, which was not true for our experiments. We can now reactivate cell proliferation in our experiments. This makes our scenario a little bit more boring. We don't see individuals anymore since cells tend to proliferate unless they're attached to another one. And so we may basically just see a branching phase and a clustering phase. But applying topological data analysis, we can basically recover basically this red regime of branching, some transition regime, and then clusters. Okay. And you have about four minutes or so just to let you know. OK. Um, I think I can finish the story, so I'll do that quickly. And then I won't get to the last story, but that's fine. OK. So why does this work? So one thing we can do is we can try and break this. So one thing we can do is start to randomly remove points. So between individual branching and cluster phases and see when the classifier refuses to work. And so we see that this actually works pretty well out to maybe about here. And visually, you can kind of see that we're losing sort of the original shapes that we're seeing. And so this is actually pretty impressive though, as we go down to 20% of our original uh, number of points, we still are able to effectively classify between these three different regions. Okay, so as long as you can vaguely construct a loop, uh, we're able to find large Wasserstein distances and uh, classify these differences. However, if we do this differently, if we start to zoom in at increasing factors of magnification, we see that once we lose this, this structural information associated with loops, zooming in about a factor of three, then it becomes much harder for the classifier to work. So we really need this uh, structural information that's encoded into these long range loops for this to work. Okay, so coming back, we can classify our experimental cell positions. So we basically did this, we did nothing else. We just kind of fed this exactly in the classifier. And amazingly enough, we were able to recover all of our experimental conditions. We got spanning phases, clustered phases, individual phases, and a conflict monolayers. We actually see that our experimental replicates all grouped together. And visually, if you look at these snapshots, they look like they should be uh, very close to each other. Okay, and so one last thing we were able to do is to match our experiments with the most similar experiment uh, simulations. And so you can see the top row here are experiments, the bottom row is our simulation. We're seeing that there's plausible agreement between the experiments and the simulations. And we also see that experimental treatment, for instance, either to uh, modulate the propulsion force or affect their adhesion also would come back to each other. And lastly, we can look at how these particles organize over time. This was very computationally extensive. Then we have a faster way to do this now, but we can use this actually to classify how quickly these cells reach some steady state in terms of configuration. And so now we have a much faster way to do this, but it seems like I probably won't have time to cover it today. Um, but snapshot is we can also do this with two types of particles. And we get some even more interesting data because it's more disordered and maybe a, less, a little bit less symmetrical. Okay, so to summarize, we've talked about maybe the unreasonable effectiveness of doing topology. So this underlying premise, which hopefully could apply to wider sets of data is that some discrete point cloud 
may be represented as a simpler continuous manifold. One thing we're still thinking hard about is how much input data is needed. Can we do this effectively with sparse data? Um, do we still get consistent answers? Are we going to be affected by very noisy data? How accurate does the input data need to be? And at the end of the day, have we learned something meaningful about biology? And for this simple system, I'd like to think so, but it's not clear that this would always be the case. Okay, and so to summarize the story about topological data analysis, we're able to learn the shape of data based on connected points and two-dimensional loops. We're able to correctly classify different experimental conditions associated with epithelial cell clustering in 2D, even with varying cell numbers because we're looking at loops and not uh, connectivity. We're able to analyze patterns of multiple cell types and there's excellent classification as long as we tell the computer that there's two types of cells and we're moving to looking at basically 3D tissues and time series data as well. Okay, and with that, I'm almost out of time. I'll thank the people who actually did the work. Susan Leggett did the experiments. Andre Baskar right here uh, did all the simulations. Uh, this work was primarily funded by the Army Research Office for in their biomathematics program. And I'll stop here and I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks. <laughs>